It's a, it's a, oh man. Hey, get the, oh man, what? Can you uh, go back and delete some of those pictures of the sand hills really quick and get ready to take a picture here? Yeah. Zoomed in? Are you sure? Put in manual if you need to. Oh my god, that thing is a fing monster. Yeah, it is. That thing is a monster. Incredible. Just take it, let's cover like 10. You need to delete every picture on there. It's just sitting in that field. I think it's a beast. Jesus, poor Peter. That house is gonna be safe, I think. Where the hell is Well, three suction vortices. Oh, wow. That's like three. It's a. It's a. Oh man. Hey, get the. Oh man, what? Can you uh, go back and delete some of those pictures of the sand hills really quick and get ready to take a picture here? Yeah.
getting really big now. Yeah, it is. Zoomed in? Are you sure? Put in manual if you need to. Oh my god, that thing is a fing monster. Yeah, it is. This thing is a monster. Incredible. Just take it, let's cover like 10. You need to delete every picture on there. It's just sitting in that field. I think it's a beast. Jesus, poor Peter. That house is going to be safe, I think. Good morning, everybody. This is a live extreme weather briefing. Talking about the slight risk that's in effect right now from western into central Nebraska. It looks like a big time land spout threat to me. Uh, non supercell tornadoes, probably the hybrid uh, types of supercell storms up there as well. Uh, the non uh, supercell tornado parameter is through the roof at about 21Z, 20 to 21Z. Uh, so. But it's also the anniversary of the Pipestone Manitoba tornado from June 23rd, 2007. There you can see the video that I've been playing live uh, so far at the beginning of this briefing. This is the time that we finally broke through on uh, intercepting a tornado just north of the border on the Canada side. Uh, finally happened in 2007. This was after years of looking at the Environment Canada website and realizing that massive tornadoes were happening up there. But not a lot of people were storm chasing up in Canada at the time. Just a, a handful of people up there. Not a lot of up-close videos as well. And uh, I remember seeing reports on the Environment Canada website. Farmer sees wedge close range going across his crop. And I knew I had to get up there and intercept one of these tornadoes. And this was one of those up-close intercepts. We were up there in a Hyundai Accent, a beat-up Hyundai Accent, that was basically overheating the whole entire way up. I had to drag my friend uh, to get up there. Uh, he was taking photos of the groundhogs on the way up to the sand hills in Nebraska. So... Didn't have a lot of photo space left on the camera uh, to take still photos of this tornado, uh, but we actually ran out of gas uh, as that wedge tornado uh, developed just to our south, and then we got pelted by softball-sized hailstone, hailstones and the hook wrapping around this supercell storm. And uh, this was actually the day after the first F5 that happened in Canada in near Eli, Manitoba, and I remember looking at that setup as well. There were deep dew points up there all the way up to the southern edge of Lakes uh, Winnipeg and Manitoba. And I believe that there was a lake breeze boundary to the south of those two lakes that that storm anchored on uh, the day before on June 22nd, 2007. Storm chaser Justin Hobson was able to intercept uh, that Eli tornado. Here you can see that big inflow jet coming in an easterly direction flowing right at that tornado uh, with that pressure perturbation so negative that it was basically dragging in everything from all different directions. Ghost train on the back side, inflow jet on the east side. I panicked a little bit here and had to crouch down in front of the car, get back into it. I couldn't open the door because the inflow was so strong into that tornado. And then it rapidly expanded uh, in the field to our south. There you can see those rain curtains wrapping around. Rain and hail. So big hailstones within those little sheets that will wrap around and encapsulate the tornado as the occlusion process is happening. And believe it or not, this thing was given a, a high end EF3, maybe low end EF4 rating. Uh, obviously, it was a very strong tornado. It did a lot of damage out there. Kind of surprised this one didn't get an F5 uh, rating as well. Definitely one of the strongest tornadoes I've ever seen. Uh, and I've seen a, at least three F5 slash EF5 tornadoes in my career. May 3rd, 1999, the Philadelphia, Mississippi tornado during the super outbreak. And also the Piedmont, uh, Oklahoma EF5 on May 24, 2011. Two EF5s that year. But I'm pretty sure this was an F5 tornado as well if it did hit anything. And there you can see it splitting up into three sub-vortices, the trifecta of vortices there uh, with this tornado uh, near Pipestone, Manitoba. And I can't believe that was 14 years ago today during the 2007 season. A very active severe weather season as well, 2007. Kind of a breakthrough uh, year there, uh, years like 2003, 1999. Uh, similar, similarly big uh, years, uh, but 2007, 2003. Uh, 2015, 2016, uh, those years definitely stand out as big time tornado years there and how that thing touched down. You can see that massive collar cloud, big wall cloud above it as well. So pretty crazy experience up there in Canada, uh, storm chasing 14 years ago. Since then, uh, now uh, Canada has gotten its own storm chasing community. Lots of storm chasers are fired up about storm chasing up there. 
uh, reporting to the Weather Service, uh, the uh, Environment Canada up there as well. It's great to see all the different brands up there, storm chasing. I even went to Canada ChaserCon years later. later. Uh, but back then, 14 years ago, and definitely before that in the years prior, you'd hardly see any storm chasers up there uh, during peak Canada season in late June through July. But you knew that tornadoes were happening up in Canada. Just had to get up there and chase them down. And it is awesome to see Canada having its own storm chasing community now as well. Definitely seems like yesterday. But now let's get into the forecast for today. Storm Prediction Center here has two different slight risks. One up in uh, the up, way far upper Midwest, northern Minnesota, uh, toward the Duluth area. Uh, you got the other slight risk there, western into central Nebraska. And uh, right now on the surface map, which it's always good to start off with analysis of that surface map to uh, check out quality of moisture, especially in the high plains. Notice how in Nebraska you have these low to mid 60s dew points out here streaming into southern Nebraska. You might think, wow, that's big time moisture, but the northwestern periphery of that is going to be battling mixing uh, throughout the afternoon. That's as the heating of the day overturns the lower atmosphere and takes uh, moisture located at pooling at the surface, stretches it out across the boundary layer, averaging it out as well, so it causes those uh, surface dew points to drop. It also causes the surface, surface winds to increase as you pull down that low-level jet to the surface, and you also mix the wind uh, through that well-mixed layer. Uh, that's one thing that uh, this moisture is going to be battling on its northwestern periphery, and that's exactly where the storms are going to fire uh, along a west-to-east oriented subtle boundary where winds are southerly to the south of it, subtle northerly is off to the north of it, a uh, lot of surface vorticity to be stretched uh, by this setup, and uh, surface vorticity, low-level cape, steep low-level lapse rates seem to overlap across this area, across the northern sand hills. So that's why I think uh, about afternoon, probably 2, 3, 4 p.m., there's uh, going to be potentially even an outbreak of non-supercell tornadoes up there, land spoots. Uh, you're going to see that hybrid word thrown around a lot, kind of an easy way of describing a dusty tornado up there. Uh, but really, a, a lot of these uh, land spouts that have clear slots right at cloud base are uh, mesocyclonic tornadoes in nature. So just because it's a high base storm and a dusty tornado doesn't mean it's a land spout. Uh, but today across northwestern Nebraska, I think that it actually is uh, a very strong threat uh, of land spouts. Strong threat of weak tornadoes, I guess I should say. Uh, but let's uh, first look at the, uh, the RAT forecast, Cape Fields for 21Z, 3 p.m. Mountain Time, 4 p.m. Central. And you can definitely see that the mixing process is evident here a bit uh, because where you have this uh, deeper cape, it basically causes the winds to veer just a little bit. You can see these northerlies. There's that west-east oriented boundary within this cape, and there's going to be quite a bit of a blob of instability. But actually the cape is maximized here uh, where you have a lot of convective inhibition in blue and the cape tailing off to northwestern extent. Uh, is because of that mixing, because you're decreasing that dew point up there uh, in northwestern Nebraska through that mixing process. Uh, the moisture is relatively shallow on this northwestern periphery here, and that's why you see a gradient of decreasing cape, but steepening low-level lapse rates up along this boundary. And I think that this boundary is going to serve as the focus uh, for development of land spouts during this afternoon, probably starting at about 2 p.m., they usually happen in the mid-afternoon up there, and then the threat of land spouts uh, disappears as you go through the late afternoon hours uh, as these storms will congeal a bit. Uh, Dan Fitz will probably be storm chasing up here, probably intercepting land spouts left and right. Uh, but basically the merger of these northerly winds and southerly winds creates a little belt of vorticity or spin uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, you get a little bit of sheer vorticity in the low levels as well when you get those converging winds like that. There's a fine line between convergence and vorticity, that's for sure. So any of these little echoes, any storms that will develop along that west-east oriented gradient will have the ability to stretch that horizontal uh, vorticity into the vertical, and then you can get the development of those uh, land spout tornadoes. And uh, you could definitely see it in the non-supercell tornado parameter uh, as well. Another tool to look at that would be the co-location of surface vorticity and uh, lapse rates. That's what we're getting here with this map, uh, wrap forecast. Overlap of those two fields is quite strong. 
Meanwhile, though, the traditional shear parameters like 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity, 0 to 3 kilometer helicity, really don't capture this non-supercell tornado threat as well as these contours. Uh, you can see quite a bit of surface vorticity here uh, oriented right along this boundary there. You can also see relatively steep lapse rates in the red uh, contours. But quite a bit of surface vorticity also extending at east of those greater low-level lapse rates. Uh, the best co-location of those fields, probably up near, well, uh, west of O'Neill, uh, southeast of Valentine, up here in the northern sand hills, uh, is where I would target. Right on the, uh, the, that zone where those uh, subtle northerlies and subtle southerlies converge on that west-to-east oriented boundary. So I do think that there is quite a, a decent threat of uh, non-supercell tornadoes later on today, and that's why we have that slight risk that's in place for severe weather. The main impact, though, is uh, going to be damaging downdraft winds. Uh, there's a lot of negative cape out there. Uh, those downdrafts are going to be gaining a lot of momentum. Boy, there's a lot of smoke in the air out here in Colorado with multiple, numerous wildfires burning across western Colorado. I am going to pull up uh some satellite imagery to show you that first though i want to break down today and tomorrow's threat tomorrow i have to say has definitely downtrended in the models uh, i thought it was going to be an outbreak of uh tornadoes there for a little while but now it's not looking as favorable and anytime you get that uh a, a, a disturbance emanating from the southwest is kind of a squeeze play between a high pressure and that a cutoff low that's off uh, California, uh, almost a moisture surge that turns into cyclonic curvature uh, phasing with a northern branch uh, cyclonically curved jet. Uh, the, the, the timing of that evolution depends on a lot of factors. The shape of the anticyclone, uh, the motion of that cutoff low, uh, the phasing with the northern branch system, the presence of convective systems as well with such deep moisture outflow boundaries all over the place. It's really the most uncertain forecast that you can get, uh, really. And that uh, did look like an outbreak. Uh, but last night's models have come back a little bit from that. But what we really want to look at is the threat today. And notice how this cape really tails off on the northwestern edge. That is because of that mixing. And this is where a majority of those storms are going to exist. Uh, this is 0 to 3 kilometer EHI, but largely that's uh, driven by that decrease in cape. There you can see uh, this is raw cape. All the deeper Cape, southwestern Nebraska, eastern Nebraska, a lot of that is capped with 4,000 plus uh, Cape out there across uh, Nebraska. If you had a storm in that environment, it'd probably be a big mothership. Uh, but the storms are all on the outer periphery of that deeper instability where that shallower moisture uh, begins to mix out. But at least you don't have a cap out there, so it allows storms to develop. Uh, the three kilometer dam doesn't seem to be picking up as much on that convergent. Uh, boundary up there for non-supercell tornadoes. It does a little bit. It uh, looks a little messy there at 0Z because of all the storms developing. But this is at 21Z. And uh, the RAT model and even the HRRR shows that boundary with subtle northerlies across the northern half of the Nebraska Panhandle, merging up with those southerlies in the southern half. But in this model, uh, the three-kilometer NAM, it's a lot more diffuse out here. You can see Lee cyclogenesis in eastern Colorado with that 993 low. A little bit of upslope uh, here in northeastern Colorado. Uh, if it wasn't so dry up here up against the foothills, maybe you could chase a couple of those storms. Southeastern Wyoming will see initiation of storms relatively early off the terrain. And if the, as those storms unzip along that west to east boundary across the northern Nebraska panhandle, I think there definitely could be some dusty tornadoes, landspout tornadoes up there, especially based on the wrap that seems to be able to resolve that uh, west to east oriented boundary a lot more favorably. Let's see how these winds get weak and out of the west out here. That's because you're mixing out that shallow moisture. Get a couple of high base severe storms here that are approaching uh, that Nebraska border. But the dew points just really fall off in the Nebraska Panhandle. And this is the three kilometer dam that does pretty well uh, with moisture across the higher elevations out here, the higher terrain. These little blobs here, uh, that shows where the uh, storms will develop, even just east of that surface low in eastern Colorado. But you just shred this moisture across the Nebraska Panhandle, western Nebraska. Uh, this is definitely going to be damaging downdraft winds, probably soft hail out there, maybe land spoots, 
uh, as well across the northern Nebraska panhandle that the, the wrap is definitely able to resolve a west-east oriented boundary up there. But this is why you have such steep low-level lapse rates because you get a lot of surface heating out there, marginal moisture, temperatures in the triple digits up here across western Nebraska. Look at the heat across Colorado too, uh, pushing triple digits in Denver. Uh, and it's not good because we're already seeing smoky sunsets out here. Numerous wildfires burning across western Colorado uh, where you didn't have uh, all the spring precipitation. A lot of that was upslope precipitation here, including that monster record-breaking spring snowstorm up here, uh, that hammer boulder and the foothills, some portions over 40 inches of snow. That's why it's been so green here across the Front Range, but uh, the Continental Divide West is incred incredibly dry, still getting dominated by drought conditions, and that's why there's numerous wildfires burning out there. And sadly, it is a, a sign of things to come. Uh, this summer likely it's going to be several numerous wildfires burning across Colorado, but you can see this triple digit heat up here across western Nebraska. That's why you get those big time lapse rates. I've seen a couple of noob storm chasers thrown around, supercell tornadoes out here, but you're going to have to get a gust NATO or a land spout, maybe a gust NATO at the leading edge of a big time mega downdraft here across the sand hills. Maybe you could work this storm near the Kansas-Colorado border for land spout potential. Might be better off down in the Texas Panhandle, working land spouts down there. But the southwest U.S. monsoon is about to come alive as well. Uh, as that high pressure gets consolidated over the desert southwest, the return flow on the western edge of that high is going to pump moisture northward. Burn scars all over the place across Arizona, Utah there. There's going to be debris flows everywhere. Many of those locations, uh, those dry creek beds and washes have not flooded in years. Uh, it's going to be similar to 2018 when I was down there with uh, storm chaser David Rankin working those flash floods and debris flows down there. Gizmo and I will likely be heading that direction as well uh, to work some of those floods. These are going to look like monsoon storms today across western Nebraska with those very high bases. I'm sure a lot of the structure bros and structure gals are going to be out there uh, trying to shoot that top tier structure from five miles away from the tornado with their tripod set up. And it's possible you could get that action out near Lake McConaughey. Uh, maybe a reflection off of Lake McConaughey there with a, a mothership supercell late. This is at 2Z. So about 8 or 9 p.m. You could get some high base lightning producers there uh, after intercepting a land spout maybe up into Cherry County uh, to the south of uh, Valentine. Five hundred winds though are decent. That's one of the uh, positives of this setup, is you do have about twenty to thirty knots up there, but that's borderline because you don't have that belt of easterlies at ten knots to really add to that bulk shear. You just kind of have a diffuse wind field. So really, what you're working with uh, in a bulk shear sense uh, are these winds at five hundred here at about thirty knots, which is thirty knots of bulk shear between zero and six kilometers is quite borderline for those supercell structures. But you could get some transient supercell structures here producing land spouts across the northern Nebraska panhandle. You get some uh, anticyclonic curvature aloft here, which should prevent uh, initiation in concert with that deeper cap, uh, with that stronger cap uh, within the uh, belt of big instabilities in central and eastern Nebraska. So really you're going to be limited to the northwestern fringe of that deeper moisture, and it mixes out largely as temperatures uh, skyrocket into the triple digits up there. There you can see those holes in the extreme heat as those anvils spread out from those high base storms, producing big damaging downdraft winds. You can see the sin here across central and eastern Nebraska. Bright colors here. Uh, greater than 200 sin, dominating central and eastern Nebraska. You can see these big anvils here also across the high plains. Nebraska Panhandle near the Colorado-Kansas border as well and down into the Texas Panhandle. But now let's take a look at tomorrow, which is going to be a very complicated setup. Let's take a look and see what the temperatures are going to be. So really, if there is any chance of a tornado, it's going to be in these moderated temperatures. So basically an MCS forms tonight, 
Uh, it surges all the way down into northeastern Kansas. And uh, in its wake, you're going to have more moderate temperatures across southern Nebraska, southeastern Nebraska, northern Kansas as well. But it's very possible there's going to be negative cape as well, convective inhibition there. The exception being maybe on this nose of extreme heat, uh, this nose of uh, upper 90s and near 100 degree temperatures punching in. Maybe you can get some initiation of storms. Uh, the back end of that MCS uh, that's going to be dominating northeastern Kansas here. Maybe a little back build into this instability and right near that outflow boundary. You might be able to get a mesoscale accident up there. But it's a very complicated setup, as we mentioned. This is just going to have to be somewhere you're out there and you get really lucky. Uh, but look at all this convective inhibition here. This is all sin, convective inhibition. So the bright colors aren't cape. But you can see in the wake of that MCS up here getting dominated by convective inhibition. Also, these hot temperatures coming in from the southwest, warm temperatures of 700, uh, development of a big cap as well. Possibly, though, right at the nose of that cap and that outflow boundary uh, with the MCS, there could be some surface base instability there, maybe near the Topeka area in northeastern Kansas, where I could see possibly a couple of supercell storms. But it sure doesn't look like the setup that was advertised yesterday in the models. And uh, that MCS is gone by 20Z, but in its wake, a lot of alto cumulus out there, a lot of stable looking clouds. You do get monsoon season beginning here across the Mountain West. Uh, some monsoon storms developing. Western Colorado up near the Continental Divide and across the northern New Mexico. These are probably going to be largely dry thunderstorms too, producing lightning, igniting fires out there. Basically the ring of fire rotating anticyclonically there. Could get some storms up across northern Iowa, uh, Des Moines as well. That could be a greater risk of severe storms. But it is a very complicated, messy pattern as you often get during the midsummer months out here. Looks like some high base storms develop across western Kansas at 22Z associated with our ejecting disturbance with temperatures and pushing the triple digits out there. Uh, actually a, more of a jet entrance type of a. Uh, here's another jet coming in. Anti, more anticyclonic curvature too. So we probably should have discounted the models yesterday considering it started off as a moisture surge in the desert southwest as a squeeze play between the anticyclone shunting off to the east and that uh, system offshore of California. I'll show you here in a second. But there it is, arriving late. This is at 22Z. You do get a, a little bit of some jet dynamics over top this ridge, uh, anticyclonically curved. Uh, some high base storms develop as you reach convective temperature across western Kansas. And then we get the development of more storms in the wake of that MCS. Likely elevated storms, but they could back build into that instability axis near and to the west of Topeka. That's probably your only play, but really it looks like elevated storms, quick evolution of another MCS that impacts the Kansas City area, even turns into a bit of a bow quite quickly. These high base messy storms across western Kansas could have some severe thunderstorm warnings with some accelerated downdraft winds out there by those very high cloud bases. Looking at the dew points. Well, yeah, better moisture out there than we originally thought, but not great still. Right about 60 out there with temperatures uh, in the triple digits, uh, about 40 degree dew point spreads there across western Kansas. Big time downdraft cape out there across western Kansas as well, uh, contributing to dry microbursts, heat bursts out there with those storms. But look at the uh, stable air here dominating that northeastern part of Kansas with uh, elevated storms developing within this environment and then turning into a bow, potentially impacting the Kansas City area. Uh, right now the models are not showing a back build into this uh, better instability or along that outflow boundary, but if that happens, that could also be the possibility of a mesoscale accident. Really this outflow boundary is what you're going to want to watch. This is at 2Z. So I wonder if there will be renewed development off to the west. I doubt it. Uh, this looks like a really messy setup on the three kilometer NAM, that's for sure. And really quick, I bet the HRRR is just going berserk with this. Actually it looks quite similar to the three kilometer NAM with these uh, storms reaching convective temperature, producing damaging downdrafts across southwestern Kansas into the panhandles. You get this boundary with a new complex of storms potentially impacting Kansas City there.
But the HRRR has that complex a little bit further east at 0Z across northern Missouri, and it hints at the development of storms along that outflow boundary into northeastern Kansas. That would be your play if you want to go for a home run. Big time gamble, though. Pretty much putting your life savings on red and roulette, which you don't want to do. But then you've got these damaging downdraft winds here across the Texas Panhandle, western Oklahoma to southwestern Kansas. High base storms also, northeastern Colorado, maybe some much needed rain uh, here, but I think these are going to be mainly dry thunderstorms across the Mountain West, igniting more wildfires out there, creating hot boobs. We also need to look at the upper Midwest today. This is at 0Z today, and look at this, the HRRR has no precipitation up there where that slight risk is located. It's got to be for a late night initiation here of a complex of storms. There it gets going at 3Z. So it's an overnight complex of storms that gets going near the Fargo area, maybe even a little bit further north. There it is, starting to develop across northern Minnesota. Overnight event develops at about 10 p.m. Southwestern Ontario through the arrowhead of Minnesota. There is a decent low-level jet there, 35 to 40 knots to fuel this. Bit of a northwest flow type of a system. Nice jet dynamics of that 50 knot mid-level jet impinging on northern Minnesota by this time. These are going to be elevated storms. Uh, dew points near about 60. Deeper moisture displaced off to the south across southwestern Minnesota, southeastern South Dakota, western Iowa. So you get that jet streak up here. Right on the northern edge of this instability. So there is some decent 0 to 3 kilometer EHIs there that are going to be fueling this storm. There is that southwesterly low level jet too that's going to try to tap into this moisture just a bit. Uh, that certainly could prolong that complex of storms. And look at this instability lift north here of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, late night. So this is about 11 p.m. midnight here as you get some instability fueling this complex of storms. Likely an intensifying low-level jet overnight. Uh, a little bit of one here. That should help keep that convection vertical on the front edge of this MCS cluster of storms here. Likely... Uh, Ooh, yeah, there you can see that little complex of storms starting to slide toward the Duluth area. Starting to weaken here in the early morning hours, but you could get some lightning. A mega shelf uh, approaching uh, north of Duluth, closing into the western finger there of Lake Superior. So that's what that slight risk is for in the upper Midwest. It's going to be a windbag type of an event. Maybe some hailers up there. No tornado threat because the moisture remains off to the south across southern Minnesota. It tries to get to the moisture. It probably does in an elevated sense up there. But that's really the event up across northern Minnesota. Uh, jet streak in the northern branch, polar front jet stream up there. Uh, igniting the storms late night tonight. And those will continue off to the southeast. Meanwhile, the complex that forms tonight is going to be, by early morning hours, is going to be into northeastern, southeastern Nebraska, northeastern Kansas here. Uh, MCS, classic MCS, uh, drifting off to the southeast. It's going to destroy our event for tomorrow on Thursday. So I'm going to abort the chase with Bob Mennery. I've already sent him a text uh, saying that it doesn't look great out here, northeastern Kansas, southeastern Nebraska. Because of this MCS that slides through, the atmosphere just doesn't recover back behind it. It tries to a bit uh, there across far northeastern Kansas. 
and you might be able to get a supercell storm along the south flow boundary a little bit further south but right now the models are not looking good for tomorrow uh, for that uh, severe weather threat So today, as I mentioned, in the circled area up there, uh, some more of some land spout uh, tornado potential. Uh, the traditional wind shear in a supercell sense, like the zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity, shows very minimal wind shear out here with about 50 degree, even pushing 60 degree temperature dew point spreads up there. It's almost impossible to have high instability up there unless it's getting inflated behind some type of a cold front with northerlies up there. So that's why you get less than 50 effective storm relative felicities out here across the target area. But on the other hand, the non-supercell tornado parameters are quite high across northern Nebraska. So it's very possible you could get some very high-based land spoots out there across northern Nebraska. Keep an eye on that. But that's pretty much it uh, for today. Uh, complicated, th lots of things to talk about. Uh, in general, uh, and I might be shifting toward monsoon mode here uh, relatively soon with that uh, activated uh, monsoon happening in the southwestern U.S. I've been talking to David Rankin a lot about that event. A lot of burn scars out there across uh, Arizona. A lot of those dry creek beds that maybe have never flooded are going to have dangerous debris flows running down them. Maybe chase some hot boobs as well down there in the desert southwest. But today is the 14 year anniversary of the Pipestone Canada tornado. So I'm gonna leave this live stream and just let this video purr here in the background. Never stop chasing everybody, dominate the storm and I'm gonna to continue to provide these live updates. Storm chase mode is gonna be activated soon, whether it's Desert Southwest, Colorado wildfires, or one of these mesoscale accidents in the Midwest, maybe Northwest flow next week. Thank you everybody, never stop chasing. Oh my god, that thing is a f***ing monster. Yeah, it is. That thing is a monster. Incredible. Just take it, it's cover like 10. Okay. Need to delete every picture on there. It's just sitting in that field. That thing is a beast. Jesus, poor P. That house is going to be safe, I think. We're hell weird. Well, three suction vortices. Oh, wow. That's like three. It's a, it's a, oh man. Hey, get the, oh man, what? Can you uh, go back and delete some of those pictures of the sand hills really quick and get ready to take a picture here? Yeah.
Keep get in reverse. Put it in reverse. All right, Reed, get in. Get in, Reed. Okay. Get in. Back up. Wait, can we go east of it? Go blast east. 